Good. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sharon. It's a good day to be alive. It's a good day to be a child of God. It's a good day to be with this family of God here at Sharon. We are excited about all that's going on today, and all that's going to be going on over the next few weeks as we continue on through the season of Lent. There's so much to uh, think about our salvation in Jesus Christ, the, the gift that we have of being forgiven, and the new life that we have, and the outpouring of the Spirit of God. We have a lot of things to celebrate. Around that there are many opportunities to be a church family and to participate in the life of what's going on. I, I know that if you're on our email list, you have received the April newsletter, so check that out. It is absolutely chock full of information and things that we are excited about here, uh, especially events that have to do with Holy Week, and I appreciate all the effort that goes into putting this together. I want you also to know that uh, you are invited to participate in any of those things that you want to. There's nobody's excluded from anything, including meetings that are listed in here. If you just want to show up at a meeting, you can do that too. I know there are a couple other announcements. Vern has one and Melanie has one, so this is a good time for that. All right. Uh, every month, the fourth Thursday, seven o'clock. Everybody's invited to Planet Fun, the recreation department, a, a committee alongside the uh, youth youth uh, group. We bowl seven o'clock, two bucks a game plus the price of your shoes. And the winner of this week, uh, this month's bowling, is Melanie Gray. <laughs> she she not only had the highest score, she had the biggest guns. Bowling the, bowling the fastest speed. So, join us. We have got a lot of food, fellowship, and fun. All right. So I have an announcement about the shower this afternoon for Jim and Susie's grandbaby. So you are all invited to join after second service in the fellowship hall. Thank you. Okay. Super. I think it was kind of determined this week that the the uh, shrimp raised approximately $3,000 in profit for ministry through Sharon Church. So thank you again to everybody involved in that. And uh, not to mention how delicious that was. <laughs> so we celebrate that today. In your bulletin are prayer requests that have come forward. And so I invite you at this time, join us in praying for Jim Whitehead Rick and Rennie Lineweber. Uh, Rick is actually leaving today to go to Duke. He's going to have some uh, surgery tomorrow. So if you are interested in keeping up with Rick. Frank Roca, Sabrina, Catherine Chase, Lisa Spain, Regina Dongel, Cliff Simpson, Britton Justice, and Tiara, and we are lifting up the persecuted Christian church in Uganda as our prayer focus, on top of all of the other things that you will be praying for this week. And so at this time, we invite you to continue on in a heart of worship. Good morning. We welcome you to worship this morning. If you'd please stand and join us if you're able. Father God, we gather this morning as a reunion of brothers and sisters who have been about their work and now come together to worship you. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us as we celebrate you, God, the object of our love and adoration. Amen. Wrestle. 
wrong, no matter where we're at this morning, your grace is enough for each of us. And we thank you for it. Thank you, God. Father Almighty, Amen. maker of heaven, of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, Son our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please have a seat. Invite any kids to come down and meet with me, Daniel, or it's, it's still us. We've got more and more.
kids at the second service, but Daniel, all we need is you for now. You're like a seed of a child that's planted in this place and you're growing roots and you're growing up and we're pouring into your life and you're getting stronger and you're I think it's a good investment in you and you're growing up physically and you're growing up spiritually oh Jesus and I think that's a perfect reminder it's springtime spring started last week and Although I have to admit, that I don't think this plant is real. The good news is I can't kill it. <laughs> but what this reminding me of is we put ourselves in the soil and we grow some roots, we can grow bigger and bigger and bigger. This plant never get any bigger. Real, it's artificial. People like you will grow in your spirit, Jesus will grow in you as you become more, not only just a child of God, but a young man of God and a man of God, a man of God someday. I don't know if I'll be here happen in you, but I'm excited to be part of your life right now. And we're all excited to be part of your life right now, too. You're a very important part of what God is doing in this church. So let's pray. God, I do pray your blessings on Daniel and every other child represented around all of this church family. We know there are many, many more. I pray your blessings on them, that they would grow, that that they would know Jesus, that they would sing songs of praises, that they would learn how to pray, that their roots would grow deep, that they would understand the importance of church family. But for Daniel and for his family, we are grateful. For those who haven't joined us yet, we pray that you would bring them to us just according to your perfect will. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you. Now we're going to do something fun. I'm going to invite our friend, your brother, James Goat. Carter, come on down. Mr. Don and I are, are excited about having you among us. Lo, these many months. You're bringing some more men with you. That's good. I'll make a bigger space. What's happening here is Goat is formally making his membership at this church a reality. And we want to welcome you in. We're not going to test you. You've already passed the test. You're here. You've been participating. You've been part of the life of the church for a long time, longer than I have, that's for sure. But today, I just ask this simple question of you. Do you love the Lord Jesus and his church here at Sharon? Hmm. With all of his heart, he says. Maybe I'll throw in another question. Will you continue to be part of the life of this church in all ways? He said yes. Now, all of you, will you support Goat as he is a member of this church family? Yes. Yeah, I thought you might. And Don, our lay leader, is presenting you with this certificate, and we want to shake your hand and... Gosh, if anybody had a camera, this would be a good thing to capture for posterity. If you even got other, other people up here, this would be a good opportunity. It doesn't need to have me in this picture, but for sure, we need to make sure that we celebrate this. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Welcome. Unless you want to make a speech. Okay, you made, all right. Your speech was the word no. That's awesome. It really is. We're so happy. There are nine other people becoming members of Sharon Church at the 11 o'clock service today. I just want to celebrate that too. Um, 
That's open to anybody that is interested in making that kind of commitment here. God is working for sure. Let's pray. Lord, we do have a lot to thank you for. Springtime, it's not just symbolic of new beginnings. If we will just open up our eyes, we'll see what you are doing. And this morning, you've given us a glimpse of your kingdom. And we thank you for Daniel and his presence here. We thank you for for Goat, for the friendships that they all have already. We thank you in advance for those who are going to be making those membership vows actually later today, especially the young ones who've gone through confirmation that are stating their profession of faith today. As we have made our profession of faith in the Apostles' Creed, we do believe in you, Lord, the three-in-one God, our creator, our savior, our sustainer. There's nothing missing in you, Lord. We praise your holy name. Father, this morning we do have heavy hearts. There are places in the world being blown apart by bombs and missiles, by bullets. There are other parts of the world being torn apart by tribal conflicts, starvation, poverty and disease. There are kids in this world who don't know Jesus. And our heart grieves over that. We pray for families who don't know Jesus. We pray for whole neighborhoods where people don't know Jesus. And so we humbly ask you, God, to use us. We don't want to wait until you answer all of our prayers to our satisfaction before we put ourselves at your service. We put ourselves at your service now. And I thank you for the many ways that is happening through this church, Sharon. There are hungry people getting food every single day out of those little yellow boxes. I pray that you'd bless them, Lord, and that they would feel the love that you have for them and that they would feel the love that this church family has for them as they come. Some of them come at night because they, they feel ashamed. Lord, take away their shame. Give them pride. Restore their dignity. Help them to know that they are highly favored. And some come in the middle of the night to stuff groceries into those yellow boxes because they are so humble. They don't want anybody to know that they're the ones doing that. Lord, let them know that they are highly favored. And we do lift up those who are sick today, who are suffering from illnesses. We pray for those who are undergoing, even this week, procedures surgeries aimed at making them whole and I pray that they would all be successful pray for those who are recuperating now from various procedures we know God that you're in the healing business and we cry out to you great healer great physician we lift up those in our church family and elsewhere in our community who are grieving the loss of loved ones and I pray that you would encourage them by your spirit give them joy even as they grieve give them peace even as they weep bring those alongside of them that can encourage them can serve them and can love them unconditionally Pray for the caregivers, Lord, who are sitting along bedsides even now, being a presence for loved ones who are transitioning to their heavenly home. Lord, buoy them with your spirit. Lift them up. Give them strength. 
And of course, God, we, we pray for our nation. All the different kinds of people that it, that it takes to make a nation, the, the food growers and the truck drivers and store clerks and the dads and the moms and the nurses and the lawyers even and the people who go out there in big boats and bring in the fish and the shrimp around here, God, and the places that process all those things, grocery stores, people to keep our vehicles moving, people who are out there drilling so that we can put fuel in our cars. Funeral directors, school teachers. It takes all kinds, Lord. Retired people who are an army around here of volunteers. Thank you for them. We just want you to know, God, how much we love you. Thank you for Jesus, for his shed blood on the cross, for the forgiveness of our sins that sets us free for joyful life, a life not only abundant, but a life free to serve others. And I thank you for all the different ways that this church family has been your hands and feet and will continue to do so. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that gifts us with faith and wisdom and knowledge. We ask for miracles, God, in Jesus' name. I want to see your kingdom come. You on the throne. Be on the throne of our hearts, Lord, and help us to know that that is the truth. Help us to understand that we are the temple of the living God. Not because of anything we've done, but because of who you are. And so now, Lord God, we pray to you the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward at this time as we continue worshiping through the giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings.
to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. just because we're being obedient but because we love you and we want to be like you and you are a generous God we dedicate them to the furthering of your kingdom through this church in Jesus name amen please be seated Good morning. Today's Old Testament lesson can be found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haram. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's wife, son Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem to the oak of Moreh. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward Negev. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Next week, Susie and I are going to be out of town, and there is a special guest speaker who's going to be leading you in worship. Her name is Reverend Linda Taylor. Linda Taylor serves in this uh, conference in the capacity of a retired pastor, but she is not tired. She is a vibrant speaker of a wonderful presence. She was my district superintendent when I served uh, in Havelock, and she's excited about ministry. She actually has been partnering with us behind the scenes to do some cooperative things in our community and with some other churches. And so please come and support Linda. She's really excited about coming and having the opportunity to share with you the word of God. The Sunday after that is Palm Sunday, and then the Sunday after that is Easter Sunday. And I, I hope you know by now that on Easter Sunday, uh, we will have a 10 o'clock combined service for the whole church family. So just kind of 
take note of that. We're trying to publicize that as many different ways as we possibly can. But today I'm wrapping up this series of messages that I've been calling Creating a Culture of Discipleship, and it has to do with being intentional as a church family about the Great Commission, living out what Jesus told his disciples to do, go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them. I think we forget about that part and teaching them everything I taught you. That's what discipleship is about. We learn from people that are out in front of us, and we grow, and once we're grown enough, we go out and we imitate them. As they have poured into us, we start pouring into others. And I think it's so important for church families to have an intentional disciple-making system. A lot of it just looks like good parenting, A lot of it just looks like good grandparenting, but in some cases, uh, we have to make family out of who the Lord brings, and that's what we want to talk to you about today, family on mission, family on mission, and I invite you to join me for our gospel reading, which is from John chapter 1. Verses 43 to 51. So this is pretty early on in John's gospel. Jesus has already called some disciples. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, are you the son of God? Are you the king of Israel? Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is a gospel reading for us this morning. Praise God for the word of God. Lord, I pray that you would help us all to receive what you want us to receive today. You're always putting people together giving them purpose and sending them out. Help us to receive our part of that call today, together as a church family. Amen. (laughs) Our Old Testament reading, if you remember from Genesis, was about God calling out, identifying a biological family. There was a couple, Abram and Sarai, and they had a family, an extended family at that. And God's call to them through speaking with Abram, the patriarch of that family, I've chosen you, I am blessing you, And I am sending you. So pick up your extended family. All this that you have worked so hard to accomplish. All these people that are now part of your tribe. And I want you to move to a land that I'm promising you. So you can set up a new nation. You will be a nation. And you will give birth to nations. I'm blessing you so that you can bless the nations. 
And if anybody comes against you, I'm going to curse them and I'm going to fight for you. But I want your family to be the seed of a movement to bless the world. In our second reading that came from the gospel, you can see that Jesus now, many, 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 many generations later, is starting to call individuals who are members of extended families of their own, who are members of even nuclear families like these brothers. And he's saying to them, I am putting you together, not just because you're united by family ties or by blood ties, but because I want you to be together for mission and purpose. I have a special need for you to come together and make an intentional family to go on mission together with me. So in the Old Testament, we see that biological family being given a mission. And now we see Jesus calling disciples from all kinds of different walks of life, saying to them, I'm making you family. And he made no question about the fact that he was the dad of that family. Later on, they would become the dads of spiritual families. As a matter of fact, this church is a descendant of those families, if you can accept that. Because that's what the Word of God tells us. And that's what church history tells us. We are the descendants of this family that Jesus put together 2,000 years ago. Glory to God. Glory to God. So for Sharon Church, what are we supposed to do? We, we talk about church family. We definitely do, and we should. We are a church family. And I think that there are times when some of our nuclear families have to make some difficult choices about their allegiances and about their passions and about what they spend their time doing and what they spend their resources doing. And, and so we've kind of set up families in some ways in an unfair way to have to say we must choose between our biological family and our church family. It's one or the other because we don't have enough to go around to give our family family everything they need and our church family everything they need. And what often happens is people make that choice and it causes stress. When they go with this family first, that's okay, except they're losing the roots and they're losing the connection to the larger family. If they go this direction, the nuclear family is really stressed out as a matter of fact, especially when one member of the family goes all in at, at church and the, and the rest of the family doesn't go all in at church, it causes real stress in the family. And I don't think God wants any of that. And so what we try to do, many of us who don't want to try to make it about we're, we're with the family or with the church, we try to do it all. Everything that's going on at church, our family's going to be there. Everything. We're all going. We're all going to be there because it's good for us and it's good for the church family. And it's, you can't do it all. Not everything that's going on at church, not everything that your family could get involved with. I probably put up the wrong sign earlier. We can't do everything a family could possibly do. Every sport team, every music group, every karate lesson, every camping trip. We can't do all of the things that families could do and still do all of the things that our church family is doing. That's not possible. Trust me, Susie and I know what it's like to try. And it's not sustainable. It's not healthy. And God actually didn't ever ask us to do that. 
And there's a lot of guilt that goes along with these things in families. And God doesn't want us feeling guilty. So what's the answer? The answer, even though it's not easy, is to become families on mission. Families on mission. And that takes some work, and that takes some sacrifice, and that takes some working out, and that takes some prayer, and that takes some family meetings here at church and in your homes around the table. Families on mission. Intentional, extended families. Households of faith. The Greek word for household of faith is oikos, just like the yogurt. I have no idea why yogurt is named the household of faith, but it is. <laughs> but an extended, intentional family on mission lives with purpose in line with God's will for their lives. Are we tracking? Are we tracking? I'll be a little bit more specific. Every, every family on mission has three different levels. And I, I asked for that, uh, that triangle. I have another triangle. I don't know what I've done with my... Susie went to all the trouble going out and finding... Do we have the triangle of family on mission? Connie or whoever's running that back there? <laughs> there it is. All right. So every family on mission contains these three things. Whether it's how you're picturing your home family, your biological family, if it's a family on mission, or whether we think of it this way as our church family. In both cases, there are these three things. Spiritual parents. Not just everybody the same. Spiritual parents. Actual moms and dads. In the church, in the past, we know that they're called patriarchs and matriarchs, right? You're aware of this. There's always, there's always some people, the smaller the church, the more obvious it is who the spiritual parents are. The larger the church, the more it has to be worked out with the church family. And usually the spiritual parents are the ones who have lived the Christian life the longest and who understand what it means to pass along the sacred knowledge of being the children of God. They take that responsibility very seriously. They know that life will eventually end for them in this world, and so they're doing whatever they can to feed into the next generation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is writing to that church, and he's saying to them that they have a lot of good people doing a lot of good things, but they don't have those spiritual parents. I want to read to you just a very short scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. He says to this church, I'm not writing this to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Hear that language? Paul sees himself as a spiritual parent to this church at Corinth, as my beloved children. For though you might have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. What is a guardian in Christ? In a real way, I think what Paul is trying to say is you got a lot of people who are sort of babysitting the kids, but at the end of the day, nobody's totally responsible for the kids. You have a lot of guardians, but you don't have very many parents, moms and dads, spiritual moms and dads that everybody knows. These are our leaders. These are our examples. These are our elders. And he goes on to 
to, to even say, I appeal to you, be imitators of me. For this reason, I sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ Jesus as I teach them everywhere and in every church. What Paul is saying is, I'm your spiritual dad, but I actually am all, I'm moving on to be the spiritual dad in some other places. And so I have a child, his name is Timothy, and I'm sending him to your church to be your new father. Representing me, who represents the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just unapologetic. This isn't about Paul being bold and boastful. This is about Paul being an example. Not being ashamed to put himself out there. Because you know the minute somebody steps out and says, imitate me, then all the other ones who have other motives start taking their shots at whoever says that, looking for any flaws, looking for any cracks in the armor. And so Paul knew what Jesus knew, and that was there's not too many people that can play that role. But we still need people to play that role in the church. And we need that in our homes, too. Spiritual parents... The second thing is predictable patterns. I see in a lot of churches and also in a lot of biological families, people are always reacting to life. There's all these things. The kids come home with something from school. Here's an opportunity. Oh, I guess we have to do that. Oh, there's all these different opportunities and the, the families are just trying to, to keep up with what's being thrown at them in life. And I think that a predictable pattern family lifestyle, this is what we do. And if some of these other things can fit into it, we'll do those things. People in a family on mission go after life and they create culture. People who are not in a family and mission, let culture define who they are and tell them what they're going to do. And that's stressful, and that's a mess. Does that make sense? A family on mission defines themselves in Jesus Christ in relationship with one another, and they tell the world how it is instead of letting the world tell them how it is. And the one who gives it all to them is our Father in heaven. Predictable patterns. How about just things like Sunday morning worship? That's a predictable pattern. If that's a weekly decision that your family negotiates, that's not predictable. <laughs> Where am I going to find these people on Sunday morning? Boom, I, can, I just know that you're going to be there. If it's unpredictable, that's hard on kids. It's hard on the church family. Not 100% or anything, but just predictable. Uh, how about dinners around the table? If you can do it, nuclear families, predictable pattern. At 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, we're sitting down together and we're going to have a family meal. At least a few times a week. But it's going to be this day, and this day, and this day. Predictable patterns. Is that realistic for everybody? No. But is it a goal? Yes. Patterns of work and rest. Predictable patterns of work and rest. It's okay to say, it's my day off. Then, of course, just having a purpose. Does, does your family have a purpose that they agree on? Or is the purpose to try to be all things to all people? Trying to be all things to all people is not a good purpose because you'll die never having achieved that goal. But talk about it as a, as a nuclear family or as an extended biological family. I think, it, what does this vision look like 
for a nuclear family or for a biological family. What does family on mission look like? Well, I think it's, it looks like this. Intentional. This is who we are. This is what we do and not reactive all the time. Missional. Here's what we, this is our family's mission. Do you, I wish Susie and I had learned about this when we were raising our kids because we really weren't sure what our family's mission was. We just did as much as we could. Eventually, when our kids were older, we, we did have a family mission and we all worked and served at a local church camp. That was our family mission. We all did different things and it was our family mission. Outside of our church stuff, that was our mission. Sit down with your family and talk about it. What is your family's mission? Really, what's the mission? Surviving? Getting whatever we can get before we die? Is that the mission? Having as much fun as we could possibly have? Is that the mission? Families, and it, it happens in our family too. It can look like that sometimes, but what really is it? Put it down on paper. Try to live into it. What is the missional purpose of your family? What if you're a single person? How does this influence you? Well, <laughs> I think it could still be intentional with your life. I think you, you can look for some brothers and sisters that you can call your family. Find a couple other people and say, will you be my sister? Will you be my brother? Can we talk about our mission? Can we do meals together? Can we set some patterns of living life together? Can we serve with a very specific point of service? Single people can be part of a household of faith, but need to be intentional about it. And what does it mean for our church family here at Sharon to be a family on mission? Well, the same things, spiritual parents, If I had given you all a, a little piece of paper and wrote and said, who are the five spiritual parents at Sharon United Methodist Church that aren't the pastor? It'd be interesting to see what you'd write because you'd have names. There's people that have that going on in their lives, but it'd be interesting to see how close we would be to agreeing on who the spiritual parents were. Having predictable patterns, I think we do that. Monthly meetings for certain groups, Wednesday night suppers, right? Predictable patterns, Sunday morning worship. We try, we try to make, that's why throwing in a 10 o'clock Easter service is what? That doesn't fit the pattern. Well, Jesus coming out of the tomb didn't fit the pattern either. So I guess we can get, get away with it on Easter. By the grace of God, if we create a, a culture of discipleship that has all of the things we've been talking about the last several weeks, that, that upward dimension that's so important that we not forget that we are children of the living God, that we don't lose the awe and the wonder and the majesty that we have that inward component, that we love each other, we, we spend time together, we enjoy laboring together, we enjoy learning together, we enjoy being part of the mission of the church, and then moving out, moving out together in intentional ways, in missional ways, purposeful ways. If we build that culture the Lord tells us we'll change the world around us. Is that audacious to say that? If we do this right, if we are a family on mission and all of your homes are outposts of that family on mission, we can change the world. If we don't change the whole world, maybe we can just change this little community that we are living in. 
Is that, a, is that a reasonable thing? We could be agents of change in our community. Because here's the thing, change is coming to our community, right? You read the newspaper, change is coming to our community. Will, will we flavor what that looks like? Will we be part of the mission of shaping the future of this community? Respecting all, that's, all the generations that have grown up around here and have served in it. Can we honor them by being part of leading the future? Or are we going to sit back and let the change happen? And then our ministry and our mission will all be about reacting to the change. Because if that's what it is, then we've lost it. We've lost our opportunity to do what God asks us to do. I love the thought. I love the thought of being part of a family on mission. I love it, I love it, I love it. And I know that it's already happening. In many of your homes, you're already doing these things. In our church, in many ways, we're already doing these things. We just need to keep being intentional. And it gives us the ability to to have enough left over in the tank if, if God asks us to go the extra mile about something. We won't be caught off guard and not able to respond. We love God. God loves us. We love our neighbors. And that's what the kingdom looks like. That's what the answer to the prayer, your kingdom come, Jesus, your will be done. At Sharon and in Supply and Holden Beach as it is in heaven. And then we can watch it and we can see it and we can claim it and we can celebrate it. I'm going to pray as the praise team comes. Lord, you've been calling people for thousands of years. You've been blessing people for thousands of years. You've been equipping people for thousands of years. Sharon, United Methodist Church is no different. You've called us to be a family on mission, and it's fun to, to just think about that way of talking about it because then we can point out where that's happening. And when it's happening, it's good, and we notice, and we praise you, and we're, we're excited about it. We want to do it more. When this family is hitting on all cylinders, Lord, heaven has come to earth. What a beautiful thing that is. Thank you. Thank you. Raise up mothers and fathers for this church family. Help us to keep our predictable patterns and let people know this is what we do. And help us to clarify our mission so we know what we're doing and why. Give us the grace as we move forward together. We're not going to do it perfectly. There's no way. But we serve a perfect God. And I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you would, as we come together for this last song, take this opportunity. Stand. Worship with us. Sing with us. Pray with us. Let this be our blessing as he has poured out blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing.
the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.